project. Her scholarship has greatly contributed to building and sharing knowledge about two-spirit peoples, indigenous research methodologies, anti-oppressive education, and the prevention of violence in the lives of indigenous peoples. Her work focuses on interventions that prevent the destruction of land and water through land-based education. Next is going to be Michelle. Michelle Brass, who you um, heard from yesterday, is a writer, speaker, health and life coach, and a workshop facilitator who is deeply committed to the health and well-being of Indigenous peoples and communities. Currently, much of her work is focused on the areas of Indigenous food sovereignty, climate change, Indigenous health and wellness, and personal healing and transformation. Michelle takes a holistic approach in her life and work, incorporating all aspects of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health rooted in an Indigenous approach to community well-being. Michelle is on the steering committee for Indigenous Climate Action. She's a member of the Yellow Quill First Nation and her resides on Papikasis First Nation with her husband and son. You can learn more about her work at michellebrass.com. And Philip Brass, sitting beside her, is a member of the Pekasus First Nation in Treaty 4 territory. He's a dedicated husband and father and traditional knowledge carrier. He is a strong and emerging voice in the areas of Indigenous food sovereignty, land-based education, climate action, community health, uh, natural movement, and traditional Indigenous knowledge and wisdom. Philip has been described as a visionary. He's a big thinker who possesses the ability to articulate the connections between the different systemic issues facing our world today and how traditional Indigenous knowledge offers many of the solutions. And you can learn more about his work at philipbrass.com. We're going to try Alex. So you 
can see um, already an erasure of indigenous women as well because this was the the card that they had to show every year to show what how many what their muskrat quota was and how many they actually caught. And of course, my grandmother was there too, but um, she's not included as a human, uh, so her name doesn't appear on the card. But so what this this um, system did was it um, created a grid, created um, a an inventory of the resources in an area, and then it um, regulated what indigenous people were allowed to harvest, what we were allowed to eat, really, and what what um, what we were allowed to um, trade in terms of fur, uh, but also the furs that we were allowed to have to make clothing and other things out of. And you can see every year he reached his quota. And when I asked my dad about that, he said, well, yeah, of course we could have gotten more, but um, they weren't allowed to. Um, this ends in, this card ends in 1954, but shortly after that, the hydro dam was built in Grand Rapids, so that was another impact that um, controlled our lives in the impossible creation. On the bottom right is a uh, permit to leave the reserve, and all of you probably know about the past system that impacted our um, lives. And then on the top right is a uh, blueprint for a house. Now this, these were like the what the government thought were the ideal houses for Indigenous people, and so they sent out these blueprints and kits, and then along with that, a manual on how to live in a house. So you can see a very paternalistic attitude and policy that um, went along with that attitude to control our lives so that we became further assimilated into and as Canadian citizens. Um, the housing crisis is something that probably, um, you know, for those of us in the prairies and the boreal region that we're quite aware of it, but the extent to which it impacts Indigenous people is really, um, it's really uh, dramatic. And I would say that it is uh, criminal because housing should be a human right, a basic human right. So a few years ago, I don't know more, um, started a campaign to address this housing crisis. We started as an educational campaign to inform people about the issue, to pressure the government, to all, all uh, levels of government, to live up to the responsibility um, in terms of the treaty terms and promises, and then also just um, recognizing that you know, everybody has the right to shelter. Um, of course, Canada you know, is, is seen as a very progressive and just country, but um, you know, on reserve and even in urban areas, Indigenous people are high, um, really impacted by uh, a lack of uh, safe housing. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that there, that was the first house that we built. So. We launched a campaign called One House, Many Nations, and the idea was that not just to um, launch an educational campaign, but we thought, well, let's take some other action as well and try to do something about this. And um, we did a crowdfunding um, campaign and we raised $30,000. We had over 300 people contribute to the campaign through donating um, money, donating resources, but also coming together and helping build this, this little house that was built in about three weeks. And um, uh, interestingly enough, it was mostly women that came out to volunteer to help build the house. There was uh, maybe two or three guys, but other than that, um, it was mostly um, girls, women, and two-spirit people that came. And even if they didn't have any experience building, they helped and everybody kind of shared what knowledge they had. So it really was a communal uh, build. This house is a small house. It has a wood stove as a heater, has solar panels, it's off grid, it's got a compost toilet. And um, the person in, in Big River that moved into it um, really was comfortable in the house and, and actually it was too warm in there so he built a little porch on it and put the heater in the 
would stop into the porch so that he could regulate the heating. Um, in building that, though, we realized that tiny homes may not be the answer. In fact, we realized that tiny homes are actually, are actually part of the bigger problem, the bigger wicked problem, and that is linking to consumerism and um, um, just mass consumption, really, because a tiny home uh, costs quite a bit of money, and also it has to be made. Everything has to be made custom for that size. Um, we also realized that we could probably build many tiny homes, um, hundreds of tiny homes, but it's not going to solve the housing um, crisis so, because it's such a big problem. Um, and the next slide uh, says that really we had realized that the housing crisis is not a building problem, but rather a systems problem. So we were trying to figure out really how can we disrupt or hack the colonial systems or institutions that keep leading to the, the same outcome over and over again. And that's when we um, decided that we needed to focus on creating relationships between houses, so creating a village, much like the way that we you know, live prior to contact. So we we're trying to recreate some of those principles and ideas that um, our, um, our parents or grandparents lived by. So we started the project in the Pasquayat Cree Nation, which is in northern Manitoba. We call it the Oaksian Sustainable Village Project. And you know, we're in the northern boreal. The northern boreal forest in Canada is being deforested at a rate faster than the Amazon rainforest. Um, so the Pasquayat Cree Nation, or Oaksian, has about 5,700 members, of which 3,200 live in that region on reserve. Um, we're short about 700 units, so meaning that not just short 700, uh, not just 700 people are short of homes. Some potentially 700 families are short of homes. So that's how how serious the how housing issue is in our community, and you know it's it's similar in most First Nations. And then there's this whole irony of of um, how is it that we have houses? when we live in the middle of the boreal forest. So our trees, our own growth boreal, are being um, cut down, they're being used because it's very strong, long wood fibers. Um, the paint, those those uh, trees are being chipped into wood chips, which is made into pulp, and that pulp is made into special craft paper. <coughs> because it's so strong, it's got specific um, clientele that it's marketed to, so it's made um, used mostly for pet food bags or for bags to make um, cement mix in. So there's, you know, that kind of just shows uh, that colonial economics aren't really working. They're they're not working for indigenous people, and they don't. I don't think they're really working for non-indigenous people either, because it's leading to leading to um, the continual destruction of the environment. So sustainability of um, necessity really has to be part of the solution um, when we're talking about housing specifically, but um, other issues as well around transitioning to greener energy or um, just in our daily lives as well. Um, the next slide shows what we did in our community. So we had a number of community meetings before we even um, discuss how the village idea. We just had community meetings where we just shared ideas and then when we thought we wanted to try this village idea out, we held some design workshops. So in the upper top you'll see that um, two uh, community members came uh, for two day-long workshops and everybody kind of pitched in. There was elders, youth, a real cross-section from our community. And then we worked with some architects that we had been working with for the past couple of years. So we had a really good relationship with them. And um, people drew out their ideas of what their ideal um, home would look like and how that home would work in relationship with other homes to build a, a small community. And you can see that um, we had more meetings where people kind of, uh, we made models and then we kind of um, worked out how they might fit together and, and then um, in the middle there is a, a picture of one of the 
scale models that uh, one of the, the people, community members, made. In the next slide, um, this is kind of our principles that the community came up with. So we had the local community needs, um, we had the larger community needs of, of the village, and then we had needs in terms of architecture and design. So we tried to to uh, document what all those needs were, would be, and that's kind of the guiding principles behind um, the way that we move forward. We didn't have any money, we didn't have any government funding or anything, and it was all volunteer. So it was all people from the community that were helping um, with this idea. So when we came up with the design, we actually um, won a design award. So somehow someone noticed, I think we were posting our Facebook page called My House Many Nations, and um, the uh, Edit 2017, which is a design expo, uh, invited us to, to bring our prototype to the design expo. But of course, we hadn't built it yet because we you know, didn't have the money for it. Um, um, the University of Minnesota actually gave us a small grant to to take the house from OCN, to build the house and take it to to Toronto. So with that money, we, we built the house. It was about $30,000, I think, and then um, it cost money to transport it. So on the next slide, you see um, at the top center is the house uh, built there in Toronto. And then we had to take it apart and bring it back to Northern Manitoba. So that's the picture of it on the bottom left side there. So we started a training program, 22-week training program with community members who run social assistance. And they um, took design training, um, training on, not training, but um, course, uh, kind of a reconnection to the land, so we call it a land, but there's a land based component, so reconnecting their relationship with trees and the landscape in the area, and then they changed the design a bit, and then um, now there's a, um, two people living in the house. The other thing that happened was in the middle picture there, you'll see a bunch of um, different um, configurations of wood, so the, the people in the training tried about 13 or 14 different models for what the walls might be made of. And so we're using cross laminated timber and um, you can see up on the, on the right side there that what they found, finally came up with was a system of layering spruce wood so that you can make a wall thick enough that um, it's very energy efficient and then it's also air can move through it so it doesn't have a problem with mold. Um, they made these pieces that were eight feet by three feet, I think they were, and they just clipped together. So we put this second house together, um, and then we were able to take it apart quickly as well because we wanted to make some design changes. So this, the diagram in the middle is our kind of plan. Um, if you zoom in on that one, if, uh, you just click the diagram. Um, you'll see that we wanted to start with one house and then um, in years two and three kind of build a cluster of homes and the idea was that the homes would work together and then there would be communal shared space as well. So um, they, they don't necessarily have to be configured in a circle but we just put them that way for, for the purposes of this illustration but um, you know um, there would be a shared, like a shared space that might have a washer and dryer have a, a larger stove and fridge and a freezer and then some meeting space so that every house didn't have to have a washer and dryer and a bathtub for example. You could just have a shower and then have a bathtub in the communal space. And then also um, we really thought carefully about the outdoor space so that it was um, safe for kids but also so there was shared space for storage and then also um, spaces for a uh, community garden and <coughs> harvesting and preparing meat and fish and so in our um, in the site that we have right now we have uh, like a motor boat and uh, net and then we've got a fish filling station and uh, a storage shed and things like that and, uh, and a garden there as well and then so the idea is that we have these little clusters that work together so that there can be 
different, like multi-generations living in one cluster. <coughs> and the next slide um, you'll see is a photo of the house. That's the house that there's two people living in, and it's um, quite beautiful. We designed this house to be off-grid, but once we got it back to the reserve, um, the band actually asked us to put it on grid uh, because we didn't have anybody to move technicians that knew how to uh, repair solar. So that's something, some capacity building that we're working on right now in the community. Um, we had composting toilet, but then they changed it to make put it on the main water system as well. So some of the things that we designed in terms of energy efficiency were changed, but in the next model, um, we're going to go back to making sure that that's a priority. I think it was mainly for convenience because um, they were just wanting to really support the people that moved into the home um, and make sure that they had uh, electricity and water. So that was another kind of lesson that we learned is that um, not everybody is comfortable with um, living off the grid or not everybody wants to, which we already knew, but we didn't realize that there might be some kind of more resistance than we thought to it. Um, and so that's kind of where we are now. And I, have, I like this slide on that says Indigenous land-based education because I think that what we're doing with Black House Many Nations is um, we're, we're trying to build homes, but we're also trying to um, strengthen our relationship back with the land. And um, so we really see it as a land defense campaign as well. And I think that's all I have for now. If um, there's any questions, um, you guys can text them to me. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. I don't know if you can still hear me. Um, we forgot to mention to you just before Alex started her presentation, uh, a reminder that everybody has cue cards or recipe cards on your tables. So if you do have any questions for Alex uh, or for myself or for Philip, just write them down on your cue cards and we have volunteers going around collecting them and yeah, just stand up and wave thank you. Um, and then we will uh, have those brought up to the front. Um, we will need to text some of those questions to Alex um, just because she won't be able to hear you um, and then that way she can answer and then that way we can streamline some of the questions as well. Great. So I'm just starting with a video. Uh, this is from Indigenous Climate Action. Um, we did interviews in January of 2017 when we had a committee meeting in Winnipeg. 